want this one? You want to change? Yeah. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Arnie Eisen, the Chancellor of JTS, and I want to welcome everyone to this evening's conversation with Moshe Halbertal about Gaza, the IDF Code of Ethics, the morality of war, and other issues very much on our minds these days. My first announcement, of course, is to ask everyone to silence cell phones. When I have failed to make this announcement, invariably my cell phone goes off in the middle of a meeting. So I say this to remind myself and to remind you, we'll silence cell phones. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Moshe, but let me, let me tell you the format that for about 40 minutes, Moshe and I are going to have a uh, conversation about a wide range of issues. Uh, we're then going to throw the floor open to you. Uh, you are given cards when you walk in the door, and there will be ushers who collect these cards. Please try to make them as legible as you can, and Rabbi Julia Andelman, the Director of Community Engagement at JTS, will sort through them and give me the ones that she and I can read. So that'll be the major <laughs> criterion of which questions we're going to select. Um, I uh, have to say, in introduction to my friend and, and colleague, Dr. Moshe Halbertal, that there are introductions one gives to academics at academic lectures, and I'm going to say a little bit of that, and then there's another introduction I want to give to Moshe. So the, the academic part, the more formal part, is that Dr. Moshe Halbertal is the Groose Professor of Law at New York University School of Law and Professor of Jewish Thought and Philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a member of Israel's prestigious Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Um, he has served as a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and elsewhere. And as you can tell from his CV and his list of publications, he has expertise both in Jewish philosophy and Jewish law and in general philosophy and uh, the general study of law. But what I particularly value in Moshe, which is what brings us to this podium tonight, is that he is the epitome of a, of a Jewish public intellectual. Moshe has taken his learning and he's used it to um, influence and teach actors in Israeli society and in Jewish communities around the world, applied what he knows to pressing issues of the day to very difficult moral issues of the moment. One high point of that activity was his work as a member of a group that formulated the code of ethics for the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, which the Israeli Defense Forces still use, including used in this summer's war in Gaza, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Some of you may have read several years ago, after the infamous Goldstone Report came out, uh, Moshe wrote a long, detailed, thoughtful response to it that was published in the New Republic that I regard as one of the high points of applied Jewish thought in our generation, nothing less. Um, I needed that voice in order to know what a person like me um, can make of the situation after Goldstone made these outrageous claims, and the question is how, how seriously do we need to take them? And I needed this reasoned voice, a caring voice, not a, not a dispassionate voice, but a voice of clarity, a voice of honesty to uh, respond. And I have to tell you, I value Moshe's scholarship in books like, um, oh, People of the Book, Canon, Meaning, and Authority, and uh, On Sacrifice, and his latest book, Maimonides' is Life and Thought, published last year. Um, there are many academic works by Moshe that I value and turn to again and again, but what I value even more and turn to even more are his writings and speeches um, on current issues of the day, like the ones we're going to discuss. So that's what we're here this evening to do, and I am really honored to invite Moshe Halbertol to JTS. Thanks. Welcome. It's an honor. Thanks. Thanks. So we are going to plunge right in here. The uh, affairs of the day are quite serious, and uh, Moshe and I agreed we're not going to have any uh, opening pleasantries. I'm not going to lob any softballs. But ask Moshe to start out by laying out in a very few moments the understanding of the morality of war and peace that got enshrined in this IDF code of ethics. And Moshe showed some of us earlier today, and you can all find it. But the principles that he's going to enunciate here are not the abstract musings of a philosopher. 
They are the operative policy directing every Israeli soldier in which every Israeli soldier is trained. They are in the IDF Code of Ethics, and it's not an abstract document on the shelf. It's a document that's learned. So we're going to start by Moshe taking a few minutes, even though it's a complicated and very important subject, but laying out the subject for us. And then, of course, the second question we're going to turn to is how this code was and was not operative in the summer's Gaza campaign, and then we'll, then we'll go on from there. So, Moshe. Well, first, uh, thank you for the warm introduction. It's an honor to be here and, uh, and address you, and an honor to be here in this wonderful institution. Um, I, I was involved or got involved in the issue at uh, the year 2000. Um, and at that moment, the nature of warfare has dramatically changed. I mean, uh, my generation of soldiers, I'm asking myself the wars that we have participated, what moral issues we faced as soldiers, usually have to do with uh, treating POWs, um, issues of looting, but on the whole it were armies clashing with one another on a discrete zone. I'm talking about the generation of my children. My, my daughter is in the army, her friends are serving, and I ask myself, what sort of moral issues they have to tackle? You know, so you enter into Gaza, you're a young soldier, someone is in the roof, you ask yourself, is he a frightened civilian or a scout? Uh, what he has in his hand is a pipe or a rifle? And, uh, and the challenge, given this condition of a war that has no uniforms and has no place, and a war in which um, moral agency is on each soldier that acts in the field, the challenge is how to prepare these young people to those challenges. And the main issue, I'm not talking about as a citizen, as a father, as a Jew, as an Israeli, the main issue is to send them to that place to do their noble job of protecting country and civilians and come back at home and said, we can look ourselves at the mirror, we did the right thing. So what are the principles? And I want to speak about three plus one. And very short will be short about this, so we have time to discuss other issues. But this is very important. The first is necessity, the By necessity we mean when you apply force, you have to apply it only for the purpose of the mission, right? The first sentence in uh, the Code of Ethics relating to issues of ethics, Achayal ishtamesh bekocho venishko, ach verak letzorech bitzua mesima belvad. The soldier will use his power and weapon only for the sake of the mission. That means that if you have to break into a house and you have to break the door or make a hole in the, in, in the wall, you cannot break the TV because the TV has nothing to do with your mission. It's the first principle of ethical conduct, the chachiyut. And by the way, that distinguishes soldiers from a group of thugs. They use the force for the mission. That's the first thing. The second thing is distinction, havchana. Distinction. What do we mean by distinction? When you aim your fire, you aim it at those who, p who pose a threat, either to your soldiers or to your civilians. You're not going to aim at innocent, non-combatants around. God forbid, children, other things. You fight, and this is what will distinguish a soldier from a terrorist. You don't aim like the other side at non-combatants indiscriminately. I just want to say one thing very short. In an asymmetrical warfare, the way we are in fighting, it's very complicated to apply the principle of distinction. Because in the ordinary wars that we were fought, you knew who the target is. The target is whoever wears uniforms. By wearing uniform, you have identified yourself as part of the other side 
machinery that produces the threat. Now, our definition is, and I'll give you the definition for the principle of distinction, is the following. Whoever, through his intentional actions, makes himself part of the causal chain that manufactures the threat is targetable. That, there is a causal chain here. It includes the planner, the one who recruits the, the, the terrorists, the one who builds the bomb, the one who carries the bomb. There's a whole causal chain. But this causal chain has to be separated and distinguished from the civilian environment. And it doesn't include, it's very important, it doesn't include civilians who cheer, uh, mo give moral support. It doesn't include those who write up ads against you, et cetera, et cetera. And those who pay for it? It's a it's good an ambiguous question. case, right? There are ambiguous cases. What do you do with finances? By the way, a, a good sign for a good principle that you can argue about boundary cases, right? right? We all study Talmud. That's the meaning of a Talmudic discussion. Uh, but that means that you have a principle to argue about. So that's the second principle, Afghana distinction. The third one, which I think is the most important in cases of uh, um, asymmetrical warfare, is achrayut, responsibility. What do we mean by responsibility? In the warfare that we are engaging in, you know that there will be a collateral harm of civilians. You know that, because the enemy locates itself in the civilian centers. And in order to protect yourself and target them, even if you target with the principle of dis distinction very carefully, you know there are going to be, there is going to be a collateral harm. What does it mean responsibility? It means the following. You have to do whatever you can, whatever is in your capacity to minimize the collateral expected harm. You cannot say only, well, I didn't intend it, or the, the enemy put itself within the civilians, it's their problem. No, since you are the cause of that collateral harm, you have to try to minimize as much as you can. This is called responsibility, achayut. It means the following. The fact that there will be collateral harm doesn't tie your hands from action because you got to protect your civilians. But it imposes you, on you, a responsibility to try to minimize as much as you can the collateral harm. By the way, trying to minimize as much as you can collateral harm includes assuming calculated risk on your troops, calculated risk on your troops to minimize that. So if a commander says, you know, I can do this mission, I think reasonably without losses, but, you know, just to be safe, I need more air cover or et cetera, and this cover will produce collateral harm, you're not going to provide that air cover. So I want to say three principles. By the way, they're very intuitive and very powerful. First is necessity. Use your arms only for the purpose of the mission. Second, distinction. Aim your, aim, aim your fire only in those in the other side that produce the threat. And third, responsibility. When you know that there will be collateral harm, you are under the responsibility to minimize it as much as you can. There is a fourth principle, and. We'll, we'll stop with this fourth principle. There is a principle called proportionality. And I want to say, I want to explain to you why do I separate it, et cetera. What does proportionality say? By the way, there is a disproportionate use of proportionality in the literature. <laughs> but, but let's clarify what is proportionality. Proportionality is the following thing. You operate again. You know there will be collateral harm. But you have to ask yourself, is the collateral harm that I'm causing, the expected collateral harm, is proportionate to the military achievement that you achieved by incapacitating this target? I'll give you an example. There is a scout on the roof. The only way of incapacitating him is with a missile that will destroy the whole house. You know that there are 
20, 30 non-combatants in this house. You say, look, the value of <clears throat> this military target, which is the scout, is not proportionate to the killing of 30 civilians. Uh, if there was, I don't know, up there a missile that is a threat to a huge number of your civilians, it might be proportionate. So, uh, by the way, usually proportionality, usually I'm careful with that, is not the ordinary soldier's business because the ordinary soldier usually doesn't know the value of the target it is attacking. It's usually on, on a higher level of planning. But on the whole, a soldier, and I, by the way, what I'm saying here is what I say to our soldiers, officer and what's written in the document. A soldier has to ask himself three questions to know, to distinguish between himself and a war criminal. Did I use my, mission, did I use my power only for the purpose of the mission? Did I aim my fire only to those who pose a threat on me? And when I expected collateral harm, did I do everything I can to minimize the collateral harm? These are the principles. I just want to say one thing, it's very important. Though I teach at the law school, I always tell the officers and the soldiers, beware of lawyers. <laughs> this is not the business of the lawyers. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have a division of la labor between you and the lawyers. You say, I shoot, the lawyer approves or disapproves. It's those sort of principles that have to be internalized by the fighting forces because they have to make the judgments at the end. And so even before we get to Gaza now, sure. I, as a person who has never been in combat, right. so I'm speaking from ignorance, right. but it strikes me that these are really difficult principles right. for any soldier to apply, whether it's a 22-year-old officer at a front, and we're not even talking about the Gaza front yet, we'll hold that for five more minutes, right. but for any officer in the heat of combat with lives at risk, do you mean to tell me that it's possible, you have to be able to tell me that it's possible for soldiers to do the calculation that you just talked about and for armies, for higher officers, to come up with the proportionality in a reasonable way so that they, ha they must have a figure because they can't do the calculus individually for every single incident, so there must be a figure that says right. 20 civilians killed, no, five civilians killed, maybe, or something sure, like that. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. So let, you, you raised two very important questions. Mm -hmm. And it's an educational issue. The first mm -hmm. one is the educational issue. How do you expect a soldier to work all those things? Mm -hmm. Proportionality, distinction, necessity, responsibility. By the way, once I talked to a to in the cadet uh, training of the officer Israeli training, and one soldier got up and says, Tagidli, tell me, before I shoot, I have to think necessity, distinction, responsibility. Exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna be completely paralyzed. Okay, that's a serious question. And the commander of the base whom I said, Ani Anello, I'm gonna answer him. I said, okay, I'm a guest here, you do the answer. And he told them something that actually I carry with me for years now. He, he, he looked at him and said, look, if someone shoots at you from the midst of a crowd, and instead of using your sniper, you shot with a tank at the crowd. Now, I'm sorry about the military language that he used. He said, you fucked it all up. The facta et cola esek, right? <laughs> you should have used the sniper because you are responsible for, the col for unnecessary collateral harm of civilians that you have caused. And then he said something very interesting to them. These are young officers training to be officers. They're 20, 21. Soon they're going to become uh, uh, commanders of 40 young kids, 40 young soldiers, sorry. And uh, he says to them, he said to them, now you are atemolim lekitatam vugarim. You are going into the mature class. And you know what maturity is? Now I really listened very carefully. I have adolescent kids. 
I want to know what maturity is. A kernel is going to tell me what maturity is. And he says, being mature is realizing that your parents are not perfect. <laughs> Meaning that you can operate in complex conditions. And the answer, educational answer to that is the following. You ask this soldier who asks you this question, he says, let's leave morality aside. You have many professional decisions to make. And by the way, mistake in those professional decisions will cost the life of your soldiers. You, you will fail perform the mission. You have to know where you shot at, you're going from left, right, etc. All those decisions. Why aren't you paralyzed? There is an answer to that. It's called training. Training means simulating those situations as close to reality it is, so that when you come to them, you're not going to be paralyzed. The same with values. I'm not going to tell soldiers a minute before go to war, three, four principles, remember. You have to make it part of their training. You have to simulate conditions close to their issues so it will become a kind of a muscle memory, a second nature to them. And it is a challenge. We're trying to do that because of this issue. So I would say the following. It will be a moral betrayal, and I'm using this term with full responsibility. It will be a moral betrayal of your troops. If you don't train them morally to face these issues, and you put them in conditions that either they will be paralyzed, or they will do things that they're not going to be able to look at themselves at the mirror after they do it. Which means they can't fight for the society again, and the society falls apart, because exactly. the society has to believe in the justice of it. Exactly. You want them to have a sense they're decent people, yeah. decent young men, who want to do what they have to do, but do it in a proper way. Rather than being machines who are just following yeah. orders. And our responsibility, I'm talking about you know, thinkers, citizens, etc. It's to provide them with the tools, right. working tools. Not, it's not a seminar in ethics. Working tools that they can work and do that. I just want to say another thing. Those principles will never replace judgment. Judgment will always have to be there. They have to guide judgment. There is no, you cannot replace judgment or discretion, but you have to guide the, the So it means you don't appoint to the officer corps people with lack, who lack judgment. Right, so, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you want, uh, uh, you want to say, uh, and when those values are internalized, and by the way, there will be mistakes. All the time there are mistakes. The real issue will be, did these principles really guided me when I made a variety of judgments in the field? Okay, so now let's, let's move on. You've already told us that Gaza is a different kind of war. Right. We're, now, we're now in asymmetrical warfare, right? right. Um, these people don't wear uniforms. There's no clear front separating the combat zone from the non-combat zone. We're fighting in urban neighborhoods, right. packed with civilians. So it's harder. So the principles apply, but it's harder. Very. So the question is, how did we do this summer? Were the principles generally applied? Were they ignored? Were they stretched to the breaking point? Where are we in this? Okay. Uh, this is a, a complex question which I'll try to answer in a clear way. And I really want to make an honest, my, I want to give you my honest account on this matter. I've thought about it, struggled it while the war was going on. Uh, we have, as I said, my children's generations are the generation that actually did the fighting. I have a lot of friends and colleagues, officers who commanded the fighting. So I, I, have, I have a lot of information and I was involved in these issues during the war as well. And I want to give you my picture. So let me say uh, five facts about Gaza that are very important. For every combatant in Gaza, there are 60 non-combatants. That's the ratio, 1 to 60. 6-0. Six 6-0. Oh. Six oh. There are, there are 30,000 Hamas and Islamic Jihad combatants in Gaza, more or less. And there is 1.8 million 
people in Gaza. So for every combatant, there are 60 non-combatants. That's the first thing. Second thing, in Gaza, the combatants are more protected than the civilians. They are in the bunkers, in the tunnels. They're better protected than the civilians. I mean, this is Gaza. That's the second thing. In Gaza, when you ask the civilians to move, because you apply the principle of responsibility, you say, well, we are going to operate now in this neighborhood, move. And by the way, move to a particular location, not run. When you do that, the combatants do not encourage, and I'm saying it with, with care, they not encourage the civilians to move. They actually encourage them to stay. Gaza is a very crowded place. That's the fourth thing. And the fifth, all operations that were important to us were done within the crowded areas. Missiles were shot from those crowded spaces. Tunnel entries were in these crowded areas. So we had to operate in, in these crowded areas, given those conditions. Now, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm speaking numbers. This is very hard to talk numbers because you're talking about human lives, but it's an important factor. Around 2,000 people were killed in Gaza. If Israel attacked them, as some people say, indiscriminately, callously, carelessly, indifferently, you can use all those terms. If Israel attacked Gaza the way the Allies attacked Dresden, out of these 2,000, there will be 20 combatants dead if you take the ratio seriously and you take the factor that the combatants are more protected. But in fact, out of the 2,000 people that were killed in Gaza, between 700 to 900 combatants were killed. Which Almost means- one to one. Either one to one, one to two, mm -hmm. that's more or less the ratio. So for an army to go from an initial ratio of one to 60, to a ratio of one to one, one to two, that means one thing, that there was a real effort, first to target only combatants, second to minimize collateral harm. That's, that's just a fact you know from the numbers. By the way, I'm not interested in, in, in apology by comparison. Check other armies operating, by the way, in less complex situations, either NATO in Kosovo, the Americans, the American army in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, see the ratios they have. By the way, usually you don't have the numbers. But if you look into it, it it's not that ratio, right? So it means the following. There, were, there was a serious effort to minimize collateral harm. It, it, if someone comes here and says Israel has indiscriminately slaughtered civilians, you know, all that, it's nonsense. It's not a serious account of what happened. By the way, that effort takes different forms. It takes a form of telling the civilians to move. It takes the form of delaying missions when there are civilians. It, it takes many forms. Using only accurate ammunition, using very good intelligence when you attack, delaying it. it, it there are many ways in which you do that effort, but an effort was made. That's the first thing. But, here I say, there were problems as well. And I want to distinguish between different type of problems, some problems that bother me. First of all, you have sporadic events that are problematic. How do you know that they're problematic? Because you hit a target and there go a family or a big family of 30 people. It's disproportionate. So you know, this, you have to look into it. What happened? Schools of UNRWA, you know, two, three schools of UNRWA. These are not targets. How they were hit? You have sporadic, episodic 
events that have to be carefully investigated and studied. By the way, some of them are mistakes. Mistakes happen. I would say at least half of our soldiers who died in the war were because of mistakes. War is full of mistakes, of human error. But some of them are negligence, not enough care, panic, not acting with responsibility and distinctions. They have to be studied carefully and investigated. These are sporadic cases. They're not systemic in the sense that this is the operational mode of the army on totality, but there were cases like that. We have to look at them. We have to punish those who are responsible. If there was a mistake, we have to learn how not to repeat those mistakes. And there were, I would say, two systemic issues, problems that I find problematic in the war, that we have to look at them seriously. The first is the targeting of homes. Uh, uh, I want to say the following. Uh, homes were targeted of all uh, you know, above, above a level of um, a certain officer core of Hamas. You're talking about dozens of homes that were targeted. Uh, uh, by the way, after asking the families to leave, mm -hmm. uh, calling them, using different te techniques of assuring that they left. Uh, I don't think that those homes are military targets. I don't think this is a serious military operation. I think it's problematic. Now, the military says, our intelligence says, a lot of those homes are actually command and control operations. They operate from their homes. This is a general presumption that has to be checked one by one. It cannot be a, a general rule. I would say in the whole that uh, the relationship to homes, I'm not talking about infrastructure, but homes, is almost the reverse to the relationship to lives. Because in life, every time you can minimize the uh, uh, death of civilians, you try to, you know, you try to do the much as you can to minimize collateral death. With homes, it's a little bit different. It's almost the other way around. If you have a good excuse to take the home, you'll take the home. And I think this is a problematic approach, has to be carefully studied. Again, I'm giving you my honest account. You asked me what happened in mm -hmm. Gaza, I'm trying to give you my, at least my assessment. There was another systemic problem uh, that has to do, and here I'm getting to a little bit detail, so forgive me. Um, um, the army has a procedure that after a, a, kidnap, a kidnapping event happens, or a suspecting of kidnapping event, and we had it with our soldier uh, Adar Goldin on the Friday, and there was a fear that he's kidnapped and he's alive. The procedure is that you have to do everything you can to avoid or to block the kidnappers moving with their soldier into a place inside Gaza where you'll not be able to find it. Now, this is a protocol that every commander, let's say a, a battalion com brigadier or battalion commander, when he enters an area, before while planning his actions, he says, in case of a kidnap, I will hit crossroads to block the movement. I will hit places where I think they might take him to hide before moving him into the interland. I will hit exits of, of tunnels that I think they are around. And because time pressure, you don't have enough time to bring platforms that have only accurate weapon systems. You use artillery. Now that means, and in, in this Friday, we used artillery. And this artillery was used in populated areas. Not to kill civilians, to block the possibility of that happening. But I think it's a problematic procedure. It's a procedure that was taken from Lebanon 
apply to Gaza. Lebanon is not as crowded and a very different terrain. I think, by the way, it's a double problem that we have. And we have reasons to have this problem. In Israel, they look at a case of a of Chevy, of a soldier Chevy. being falling captivity as a strategic moment because of the Gilad Shalit deal and everything. And the Hamas tried all the war to get a soldier. Uh, and that creates an atmosphere that you have to do everything to avoid it, including using that type of ammunition within a populated area that creates a lot of civilian loss, which in this case is disproportionate to the event that's happening. This is, so you ask me now, I mean, I, an account on Gaza in 10 minutes in the Upper West Side. I'll tell you, the, my account is the following. There was a serious attempt concentrated serious attempt from the higher command to the lowest levels of the operational levels to minimize collateral harm. Israeli soldiers do not target civilians, and not only that they do not target civilians, when they know there will be collateral harm, they try as much as they can to minimize it. How do you know it? Just by the numbers, just by seeing ratios, numbers, etc., etc. Besides my own knowledge of operations and how they are conducted. But we had problems. We had episodic problems that have to be studied. And we have, at least as far as I go, two major structural problems that need to be revised and looked at. That's my account on Gaza. So I'm going to ask you two more questions before we turn it over to the audience. The second one. You all know what it is I'm going to ask him to talk about. I'm going to ask Moshe to talk about where we are right now at the present right. moment. But let me ask you another question as the Chancellor of JTS. I don't know if it bothers anybody else here, but it bothers me. We've talked about the operation of the Israeli army, the army of the Jewish state. And I have, I'm very proud, needs to say, that we are protecting life to the degree that we are, that we're taking this care, that we're trying to operate in a morally responsible way. Right. Does it matter that you gave this entire presentation without a single reference to any Jewish source. Do we need Judaism at all? Does it figure at all? Does Jewish tradition matter in thinking about how the army of the Jewish state conducts itself in battle in the 21st century? Or is Israel such an unprecedented situation that our sources have very little to say about it, and if they do, they're dwarfed. They're dwarfed in impact by all of these non-Jewish philosophical sources that, that you've been quoting. And is that a problem? It's not a problem, it's a challenge. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a good challenge. And, and Say I think a little more it's about that. important. Clearly, I mean, I come to this issue, I'm inspired by, by my upbringing, my Jewish upbringing, what I understand of Torah. And I ask myself, uh, you know, the justification of taking life in Jewish tradition is defending yourself, self-defense. And there are rules about defense. For example, necessity. There is a rule if someone threatens you and pursues you, you can, you can actually protect yourself by injuring the person. And you have killed that person you, have, you are obligated in killing a human being. That's what we call what? Necessity. You have to use force only for the sake of the mission. There are also values in Jewish life in halacha that say you cannot save yourself by killing an innocent person, by targeting an innocent person. My sumak damach midama dechavrach. The life, your life is not more important than the life of an innocent person whom you are taking in order to save yourself. So there are different analogies that we are inspired by. But let's be careful. I have yet to find one monstrous act that you cannot justify by quoting a verse. Right. <laughs> and we hear these verses quoted every week. Every week. You hear it from there to there to there to there. And this is magnified in places where 
you don't really have precedent. Halacha comes to it, Jewish tradition comes to it without serious precedent. We didn't work out the problem of wars for years as we worked out the problem, I'd say, taking interest mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or, or different varieties of neighbor laws of tzedakah, etc. We are, we are new to the business of war. And in that moment, without actually serious precedent, a Jew, a, a, a Jewish a rabbi, has to fall back on his own moral campus that is nourished by Yadut. And God forbid to attack conscience. The religious attack on conscience is the most dangerous thing in this moment. Because you have to, at the end, ask yourself, it says in Torah, Oave Hashem Sinura, those who love God have to hate evil. It's also a verse. And you have to ask yourself, I don't have a guidance, you know. The Shulchan Aruch did me, didn't give me a, an ethics code for military. I have references, I have ideas. And at the end, I have to ask myself, right? Nachmanides says something very interesting in his you commentary do? on Torah. You're just going to translate that line you just said. Yeah. yeah. You should do what's right and what's good. And Nachmanides says, why do you need this verse? Actually, you have all those other commandments. And he says, says something very interesting from the point of view of philosophy of law. He says, law will always have lacunas. The, law, the positive law cannot cover all life. And in those lacunas, says the Torah, you have to do what's right and what's good. So when you do this work of thinking through the ethics of war, is it like the conversation just now? You check back in with Jewish tradition periodically? You, sure. You, want, yeah. you, you look backward. You don't want the rabbis to have authority on these matters. You don't want the rabbis to have authority on different types of matters on the whole. Right, but certainly not but on But not on this. Uh, uh, there is a discussion. There is an inspiration. There is an engagement. And you are engaging with your tradition, with the best of your tradition, when you're trying to formulate those things including, by the way, the tradition of Tzal through the generations, international law, morality. It, there are many things to bring to bear into this issue, and your Jewish deep convictions come to bear. Actually, what is, what is at stake here? At stake here is the following. The creation of the State of Israel is a momentous event in our life. It's the first time Jews have the means to define and own their own political fate. For that, they need power. And our challenge in this moment of history is to use it in a proper, decent way. That's the challenge. And it's a Jewish challenge. It's a historical challenge. And, and for that, you have to bring the best of your tradition, the best of thinking into this problem. So I'm going to cheat and make my last question a two-part question, picking up exactly where you just left off. All right, so our challenge is November the 20th, 2014. Five people or more were just killed in a barbarous attack on a synagogue in Harnov. We are in danger of a spiral of violence in Jerusalem. Tension is very high. And there are a lot of people who've given up hope in the peace process. And I think it's two ministers of the Israeli government to date have just told us that the two-state solution is dead. Okay. All right, so where are we? That's the first part of the question. And, and when you figure that out in two minutes, yeah, I'll give you the second part of the question, which is, what can we do? We're not you. We're not in Jerusalem. We're not serving in the army. Most of our kids are not serving in the army. Right. What is it? What is our role in helping the Jewish people face up to this challenge at this historical moment that you right. just posed to us? So... This is very important questions, and I, here I enter the realm of politics. That's fine, right? Okay. We are entitled. Right. And I'm expressing my own political convictions. I'm sure there is a whole variety of political convictions here. I want to go from the war to the problem you raised about today's events. 
when you know that you will be engaged in a war that with all your efforts you made, there will be a lot of civilian death, collaterally. You are responsible to do as much as you can to avoid it, if you can. And here I think we can do more. I think the blockade on Gaza, the, the economic blockade on Gaza is morally problematic, wrong, and politically counterproductive. And if I had to decide now about the fate of Gaza, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go in the following mentality. I would say, well, if we moved from the status quo, it's a sign we lost the war. So if they had six mile fishing uh, rights and they get 20 miles, wow, that's very bad. Seven miles, it's fine. I think it's an infantile way, it's not a serious way to look at the problem. I would say open Gaza's economy without giving up your security concerns. That means everything economically, let Gaza bloom. Let them have something to lose. Don't corner them. By the way, being honest, I'm not sure that will prevent the war, knowing Hamas and knowing their animosity and hatred. But you have to do it. Second, and that's very important, don't corner them on issues that have nothing to do with your security issues. It's immoral, it's counterproductive. Let them, let, let them flourish. I will bring, by the way, now I will do it unilaterally against the Egyptians because the Egyptians have different interests here. I would allow work to come in, everything. The other thing is, there is a Palestinian partner who has committed himself to nonviolence, Abu Mazen. You have seriously to engage him. Again, here, I'm not sure you're gonna get a deal. But, but when you insist on your interest, it should be interests of your security, not settlements, not Harabite. All this is nonsense. Hey. No, We're not being political here. I'm just saying the following. When you, I'm saying the following. It's very important. Every war, every war has to, you have to try to avoid it because it engages you killing of your own soldiers or civilians killing the other side. In a war that is involved, that collateral harm is involved, you have to do a lot. And I think we don't, this, this government is not doing what it should do in that level. It has serious, I'm saying the following with care, it has a lot of space to go to create a different atmosphere without harming any of our serious interests that we have. We have interests, but they're not what we are sticking on today. So that's, if you ask me, my own convictions and a problem I see. And, and I say this is, uh, this is important when you are engaging in a war that you know with everything you do there will be civilian death. And you have to ask yourself, did I do whatever I can that that shouldn't happen? Now we come to Yerushalayim today, right? I'm Yerushalmi. We are at the tipping point and we, Chas Shalom might regress to a, a third intifada. I remember, by the way, the, the second intifada in Yerushalayim, what it was like. I live in German colony. I know my, I had children then in school. I know my fear of putting my child, my children into a bus or going into a restaurant. And you don't want that to happen. What should be done? Well, first of all, take the issue, 
I, I would say the following. In this moment, listen very carefully to what the professionals are saying. I mean the professionals is Shabak, Shin Bet, Shin Bet, military intelligence, Mossad, because these are people who don't care to appease a certain primary groups in their elections. They ask, what is the problem? Now, the head of our Shabak already for months is saying, activity around the Temple Mount is inflammatory. Don't do that. And there are small-minded politicians who want to cater to constituencies playing that game. Now, this is politically dangerous, and it's Jewishly sacrilegious. It's Chilul HaKodesh, right? It's going to our, the sacred of the sacred and make it a, a, an inflammatory, hyper-national symbol. It's not our notion of Kedusha, of holiness. By the way, I think that the whole, uh, the whole slogan, if it's sacred to me, it's mine. It's a very, against the very idea of the sacred. Because if there is something about the sacred is, the sacred is not yours. By the way, it's not an accident that we as Jews, in the most sacred place to us, we're not allowed to walk. It's interesting. So how can we say that we own it? So we have a flag there, but we're not allowed to walk. But few Knesset members have to walk there, right? After all, they're defending the history of the Jews. So I would say the first thing, now this is not only our problem, it's their problem because Abu Mazen is inflaming that as well. And he says, you know, the Jews are taking over Al-Aqsa. He's riding on a tiger because these elements will gonna swallow him because when Arafat was doing his shtick with Hamas, at the end Hamas took over Arafat. So I, the first thing I would do, I would say, let's see if we can take the issue of Alaska, Alaksa, the Temple Mount, outside of the conflict, because this is a, a volcano. By the way, here again, from our point, I would allow everyone to come to Alaksa. I wouldn't say, you know, above 60, under 50, etc., etc. Come on. We can control the situation. But don't give the other side a sense that you are taking over their holy spaces. And, you know, here's an American, maybe an American way to go about it. That's the first thing. The second thing, be careful. This is very painful and it's very difficult. It is very difficult, humanly. Defend yourself with determination against anyone who comes to harm you. But don't, for political purposes, for public opinion purposes, engage in collective punishments of different sorts. I think the destruction of homes of terrorists, it's not a serious act, it's a problematic act. By the way, you're gonna ask anybody in the army, they're against it. There was a committee in the army that said it's not an effective tool. You take a family, you know, you make him a home, what did you, what did you gain? And by the way, be very careful. I mean, people are afraid. They don't want to see Arabs. You have chains, you have supermarket chains. You have Arab workers. Can you imagine them all being fired? 3,000, you have now 3,000 Israeli Arabs, by the way. Families unemployed, in poverty, etc. That doesn't work for you. It's basically not moral, but it also doesn't work for you. And there is a lot of strength in ipuk, in restraint. And restraint is not weakness, it's power. And you have to send a message, the street is boiling. And there are very toxic elements that have to be isolated. They have to be put outside of the camp. 
You, you cannot tolerate it as a, as a, in the civic body. That's what I would do. I would do even something further. Again, listening to the professional opinions. I would seriously reopen the political process because without political horizons, there is no way this. Now you ask me, I'm sorry, this is a long answer. Yeah, I'm gonna cut you off in a minute. Uh, you asked me about two-state solution. Is it over? There's no other option for Israel. And I'm saying it knowing that the risks involved, there are risks involved. Whoever said that there are not risks involved, you don't have to trust him, or you shouldn't trust him. There are risks involved. What is, what is Israel without a two-state solution? It's a multi-ethnic state. Let's put it on the table. With a small Jewish majority, small, controlling a very large, maybe an Arab majority, maybe the same. Look at the area around us in the Middle East. What's happening? The collapse of the multi-ethnic states. They all collapsing. Iraq, Syria, you, you want to make Israel a multi-ethnic state? This has a future? You want your children to live there as a Jew? I, as a Christian, I wouldn't want to live there. Kalvachomer as a Jew. So whoever says, you know, one state, he's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, in, in Lebanon, in Syria, where all those multi-ethnic states are collapsing, they at least talk the same language, Arabic. They, by the way, more or less belong to the same religion, though it's very tough there. More or less. Still, Shia, Sunnis, etc. You think that, that we, two strong nation, national movements, the Jewish national movement, the Palestinian movement, can share a space in a binational fantasy, it's, it's not a sky. It's nonsense. It's not an option. So politicians who lead, they're not only protecting the status quo. That's the problem. I mean, status quo is fine, but there is no status quo. They actually entrenching and making the two-state possibility or a condition of irreversible thing in the, in the ground, so you ask yourself, what are you doing? We, we, we think about the next generation, of two generations ahead. You're gonna end up a, having a country that might be more secure, but not worthy securing. That's the truth. It's a difficult truth to face. So what do you have to ask yourself? You have to ask yourself, I, what do we need, seriously? We don't need to settle in Hebron, seriously. We need security. And you ask yourself, on the one hand, how can I get to a two-state solution while ensuring as much as I can my future security? This should have been the heart of the negotiations, not settlements. By the way, I must say one thing. Our government, it's my government, has cornered Israel in a defense. It made the settlement its cornerstone of foreign politics. This is something indefensible, seriously. We have real interests. We have real concerns. You want to say, you know, I'm insisting on troops on the Jordan Valley. That's a serious concern. Negotiate it. So that's my answer. So I'm going to put off the second the answer sure. to the second part of my second question because I want the audience to have a chance to uh, ask you questions. I promise you by the end of the evening, I'm going to get Moshe to tell us what he thinks our role should be in this. But right now, I think it's time for the ushers to collect the cards and for Julia to sort through them. Well, you know what? Why we're doing that? Can we do two things at the same time? Why not, as we're doing this process of handing your cards in and passing them up to the front to Julia, who will sort them for me, why don't, Michelle, why don't you spend just a few minutes saying, all right, I think everyone here would, would say, you certainly have the right, the authority, your kids are on the line, 
You've been in the Army. You're dealing with soldiers. Your daughter's boyfriend is in Gaza this summer. But how about us? So what, what role is it? Because I would make the case to you that the Jewish people, if it's going to be one people, this can't be your problem and not our problem. Sure. We have to be involved in this. Sure. And if it's done in the name of Judaism, sure. I share that tradition. And, you're, and the most important development, as you said, in the history of the Jewish people in a very long time is the state of Israel, which means that it's the most important development in my history as a Jew Absolutely. sitting here in New York. Absolutely. So having said all those things, and you agree, what is it that we should do and should not do? What role can we constructively play here? What kind of conversation should we be having in the United States of America? Okay. Now I'm, I'm appealing an as an Israeli mm -hmm. to my uh, American Jewish brethren and sisters. There is one thing you should do, which is be engaged. Be engaged. And by that I mean the following. If you have a conviction about these matters, express it, fight for it, and try to impact whatever you can for what you believe in. Because if we're gonna tell you in this paternalistic form, you just have to support whatever we do, what it will breed at the end is deep indifference, which I see in certain segments growing. I would say, for me, look, we ask, let's say, Israel is actually leaning strategically on American Jewry as well. And uh, American Jewry, with its all diversity, by the way, it's as diverse as Israel, has to insert itself into the debate. If you think that whatever I said is wrong, by the way, you have quite a lot of channels, channels to work against me. Too many channels, as, as far as I say. American Jewish channels. You have Edelson to support, other things. By the way, they, they, they don't shy in engaging, which is fine. Alan, welcome. Uh, I, I really dislike this kind of paternalistic attitude since you are, your life is not on the line, you should, you're not entitled to say anything. No, you're entitled, you have your judgments, opinions. By the way, your life is impacted by what Israel is doing, if you want it or not. And, and not only that, we are calling for your solidarity. So I call you one thing, I ask you one thing. Whatever you believe, first of all, be informed. So you want, you want to have an opinion, be informed. This is, by the way, an obligation of every citizen in a democratic world. Be informed. And when you are informed and you, you have a conviction, work for it. There are many ways in which you can act, engage, and fight for the Israel you want to have. That's, my, that's and, the only thing I want. And, and you're comfortable with American Jews lobbying Congress to vote down requests from the Israeli government to oppose the policy of the Israeli government? You're, Look, you're okay with that? Because that strikes me as, as what, what, dangerous. Okay, let me say, what do you mean? Uh, here again, American support in arms, you know, you know that with all the missions we did in Gaza, at a certain moment of the war, we needed the American depots to be open so we can have some ammunition. Exactly. That's why I don't want, I'm just entering in here to the politics myself now, I don't like the idea of I American also, Jews opposed to the existence of Israel or opposed to the settlements oh, sure. saying to Congress, we don't want you to give Israel any more arms until Israel demolishes think, those settlements, think, which puts the soldiers in danger. I think it's a very bad position. Right. Yeah. But, but you wouldn't I stop us from doing I, it. I, I think I, I would argue against it. I would mm -hmm. say, look, this is not... You, you don't pressure Israel by putting it in danger. This is not an act of pressure. But if you care about this issue, I would say, if you want another Israel, etc., I would say the other way around. Provide them with more sense of security so they can actually compromise. I, you know, if someone says, you know, my American Jewish uh, mission here is to pressure Congress to uh, delay 
weapon shipments to Israel. I would say, you know, Israel is depending upon these weapon shipments. You want to change policy? I can give you some better ideas. Okay. It's hard to read. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Can you discuss the war aims of the Gaza operation? Were they met? Did they justify this application of force? Why is it a hard question? It, it is a hard question. Look, I just want to say one thing about application of force. Here, by the way, I salute the government. I think they, they showed restraint. And they showed restraint against the temptation, just take over Gaza, just finish it. Taking over Gaza means a lot, a lot of deaths. Israelis, Palestinians, etc. And uh, it wouldn't solve the problem. So you had a dilemma, which is how to stop them doing what they're doing without actually conquering Gaza. Given that dilemma, I think we did fine. Uh, did I have tactical, but we all are armchair generals. We have tactical solutions to the, to the tunnels, to this. Why don't you come from the sea? Why don't... Okay. Uh, on the whole, the war aims were to stop aggression against Israel. You had rocket shooting, you had 100 rockets a day shot at Israel. There was a tunnel threat, tunnels threat into our civilian population that Israel cannot tolerate. And we tried to stop it. Um, and it stopped. By the way, it didn't stop because Hamas produced a new ethics code or something like that. <laughs> it stopped. Now, I want to say one thing about, here is another proportionality issues. People come and say, look, you lost only 70 people. They lost 2,000. It's disproportionate. And then you ask, uh, I, I don't like this argument because proportionality here is not body count. So you say, what do you mean? We had to wait till 500 of us would be lost and then we can kill only 505 on the other side? Vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis justified attempt. At that moment, they were justified, fully justified. Country had to protect itself. Justified attempt. You can inflict harm on the other side. I'm talking now about the combatants on the other side as much as needed to stop it. If it's 10, it's 10. If it's 100, it's 100. Where do you ask the question of proportionality? Not on the body count. You have to ask, when you engage those combatants, did you protect the civilians around them? That's the question. Not, are you allowed to operate against a threat given that they killed only three by now and you can kill only four? It's not a serious argument, it's not a moral argument, the state cannot operate like that. But so, I do worry, I have to tell you, and we got a question to this effect, so I'll now put it into my own words. I do worry that we're in a no-win situation now, that no civilized state can protect itself against the kind of things that Israel's up against without descending into the same kind of barbarism. So the question is, can, can we win this way? You're saying we have to do it this way, otherwise, we're lost because our soldiers are paralyzed and, are, and they have to be able to look themselves in the mirror and sure. the parents sending their kids into battle have to know the cause is just. But are we, then, are we then losing our ability to fight this? Are you confident still that a civilized society and Israel wants to be a supremely civilized moral society can actually fight this way and win? I would say the following. If a military commander comes and says, look, all these rules, with them I cannot win. Mm -hmm. Let me shoot the way I, 
by the way, that's not the way our officers talk, but let's say an imagined one. I would say, and I have noticed that there is a relationship between lack of professionalism and brutalization. You have, we have, Baruch Hashem, enough means to win wars, protect our civilians without becoming barbarians. And by the way, the best way to fight your enemy is to kill your enemy, not to kill everything around him. And, uh, and, uh, or to incapacitate him. So I, I, I would say it's not our weakness that we are civilized or we try to be civilized. It's the source of our strength. Because if Israel would have engaged in massacre, the way, by the way, some people talk about what happened, what you'll have is a breakdown of the backbone of Israeli society. Because there will be many soldiers for good reasons who say, this is not the type of war I want to fight. And our strength depends on our moral strength, on our moral conviction, on us staying whom we are and not moving and shifting hysterically by the trends. And I would say the following, this set of limitations do not incapacitate your capacity to win. Actually, I would say it helps your capacity to win. I will give you an analogy. Let's take the case of torture. If you will allow an interrogator to use torture, you say, do everything you need to get this information. It's not going to devise anything interesting. Inven necessity is the mother of invention. A, a smart, serious army can win its war with the limit, with these limits. And by the way, Israel has done it. We failures as well, but we've done it. Israel went to Chomat um, Magen. Um, how do you? Uh, Protect, protective shield. Protective shield. All, all the fancy names. Israel went to an operation protective shield in the West Bank, in Yudav Shomron fighting this type of war, actually, to a certain degree, to a certain degree, overcoming terror without massacring civilians. Without massacring civilians, without a Sabra and Shatila and, and whatever. And the last thing you want us is to begin to look like Hamas or ISIS or whatever. At that moment, I will tell you, we lost. Because, first of all, you would lose the will of the people to fight, but even more so, there would not be anything to fight for. Because what we are fighting for is a society that we believe will be decent. That's part of its decency. Look, there isn't a greater crime for a state for an army than targeting civilians. There isn't. And when you tell soldiers to do it, they will be very damaged people when they come back home. So for all those reasons, this is not, if we are failing and we have some failures, it's not because we are moral, believe me. That's not the source of our failure. And we, in the level of morality, we still can improve as well. So I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to paraphrase another question that, that several people asked here um, that we talked about earlier today. One of the things that impressed me this past summer was there was almost wall-to-wall -wall support among Israelis for the war. It, it, it would not have been that much had the government decided to right. go in big time. But what the government did enjoyed almost wall-to-wall -wall support, especially after the discovery of the tunnels. And that was true here for large segments of the American Jewish community. Oh, yeah. And this was in marked contrast to the media coverage of the war in the United States and around the world. Right. So the question is, how do we account for that and what can we do about it? Why is that the case? Okay. 
what can we do it about it? Two things you shouldn't do. First, you shouldn't say, we are the most moral army in the world. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, you have to seriously and honestly describe what you're doing. If you want, you can also compare it to what other people are doing. I had a, I'm teaching now at Yale Law School, and there was, I was asked by the dean, this is the, you know, to engage in a conversation about Gaza with actually Chavis. Who is Chavis? Who's the, the guy who's uh, leading the commission. The, the next Goldstone Commission. Right. Yeah. So there was a conversation. One, it's interesting, one Israeli student, an LLM student, raised his hand. I mean, this is a heated debate. He said, I'm a soldier, I was in Gaza. Uh, we actually try very much to reduce collateral harm. And we want to really learn from other armies how to do it better. Can you give me an example? <laughs> okay, now, I, I want to say the, the, the best thing to, to, do, to go about this is two things. First of all, to say what issues you encounter, how you go about them, and to admit failures and mistakes and investigate them seriously. That's it. It's not a big deal. You have to do it honestly and seriously and openly. And the last thing you, have to, you, you, you shouldn't do is everybody is anti-Semite. Because out there, there are some anti-Semites, definitely. You're not going to convince them. But there is a lot of good willing people who really don't know what's going on. And they need explanation. And this explanation cannot be by way of slogan, we are the best, look at you, all that. It's, these are the issues that we encounter this is the way we go about it. Here we make mistake. This we have to interrogate. This we, and that's it. And I think we are failing in that respect. Uh, or to a certain degree, we can do much better, much better in this level. So we have time for at least two more questions, depending on you. So let me ask at least two more questions. So here's one that, I'm, again, I'm taking several questions and putting them together. There is a thought, there's an argument which says that the end justifies the means, not in every case, but at least in some cases. And what, I want to know about the moral status of that argument. So the Jews have used violence in the past. One, one, one questioner reminds us. We had the Haganah and we had the Etzel, we had the Irgun, we were terrorists. Right. And in retrospect, one could make the argument that that terror was instrumental in getting us a state. No, you reject that argument historically. Historically, do, sure. Let me I make mean, it harder for you before you do that. Sure. You, you talked about Shabak. You used the Shin Bet and its assessment as a consideration in what our policy should be. Yeah. We know the Shin Bet did not gather its information by calling on people and asking them very nicely. What would you say about this? It, it arrested people in the middle of the night, did sometimes not very nice things to them, an understatement, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And it seems to me that you're, we are relying on that operation in gross form, no? Sure. So, so in some sense, every state is going to say, to some degree, the end justifies the means, and where do we draw the line? These are five questions that you I asked know, me. I know. <laughs> I have the easy part here. I ask you answer. Sometimes I'm in your chair. So let's say the following. Historically, yeah. right? Lehi and Etzel were engaged in terror acts. Yes. By that I mean deliberate killing of innocent civilians. The mainstream of the Jewish Yishuv rejected it and fought against it. Not minor voices. That was the mainstream of the Yishuv, including, by the way, its spiritual, rabbinic, ideological leadership. Figures like Shai Agnon, not doves. By the way, everybody who knew Shai Agnon, he wasn't a dove. But he thought that it will contaminate and will destroy the well-being of the state of Israel if it will be founded on acts of barbarism. And those acts of barbarism didn't establish the state. There were other, other efforts of state building, including, by the way, use of power that established it. 
Now, Shabak. Um, Shabak also has to have constraints and ethics. By the way, one thing of the co corrosive fact of the one state is the effect that it has on the Shabak. I'm not saying it. Six head of the Shabbat, Shabak in a quite popular movie have said it. Mm -hmm. They said, this is not a normal way to go about it. What we are doing, which is very important, is to give the politicians an, op an opening to try to solve the problem. It's not an ongoing way of, of running a country. By the way, they also have to have their own limits, how they operate, what they operate. For example, torture should not be allowed. They're, they're different things. I mean, not every way to gather information you do. You can have high quality information without being a bastard. Uh, do other, uh, that's what I, I, I would say, look, I think we come back to the same issue. I, my assessment is that the decent use of force is not, doesn't undermine your security. It's actually strengthen your security. And, and this is even tour in Israel. You know, the Israeli army is mostly reserves. You think you can send reserves to kill innocent people? They have children themselves. Or tell them to act barbarically because ends, means justify the ends. They're not going to buy it, and for good reasons. And the uh, Israeli military depends on an ongoing consent of its fighting forces to feel that they're doing the right things. We, help to, we have to help them to do the right things. I'm going to finish with uh, a question um, that's certainly on my mind, I think not just on my mind. So what, what do you think we can reasonably hope for in the year ahead? Not wild messianic hopes, peace breaking out all over the Middle East tomorrow, but what would it be reasonable to us to hope for in the coming year? We always have to hope, first of all, right? We always have to hope, and Jews hoped under more difficult conditions. But what is realistic as well? You hope that this moment is not going to spiral into a larger wave of violence. I think, I think you have to start with Yerushalayim. You have to calm Yerushalayim. And it's reasonable to hope that that could be accomplished. Yeah, it could be accomplished. Mm -hmm. It could be accomplished. Uh, and then, and then afterwards, you have to ask yourself in what way, what can I do on my part in terms of reigniting the political process, easing the conditions in Gaza um, um, in order to change the direction of how things are going. And at the end, you have to be strong. You have to be strong. You have to be prepared if this fails to fight and defend yourself, we have done it, it's fine. We have done it. Uh, and for that reason, I do have hope. I do have hope because we, we, we are very resilient people. We have come back from harder, more difficult situations. Emir Hashem will come from this situation as well, stronger and better. Thank you, Moshe Halbertal. Um, you might want to come back to JTS on December the 2nd when Abby Pogrebin and a group of friends, well-known friends, are going to be talking again about Hanukkah. And you know on December 11th, New Yorker cartoonist Roz Chast is going to be here to discuss aging in America. Thank you all very much.
was fine. Thank, Thank you. Thank it you. worked.